Hi, my name is Aswat Damodar and today's topic is a pretty boring one. I want to talk about how to get information from financial disclosure forms for valuation. Doesn't sound exciting, but if you think about it, almost all of our raw information comes from annual reports, 10Ks, 10Qs, whatever the appropriate filing is for your company. Let's start with a basic premise. Over the last 20 or 30 years, information requirements on companies have increased whether it's the SEC or the equivalent uh, an authority in, in your particular country that covers companies or annual reports. If you look at what is revealed to investors right now, it's a lot more than used to be revealed 15, 20, 25 years ago. And that's a good thing, right? It is, but there is a dark side to it. As companies reveal more and more information, what's increasingly happening to annual reports in 10 case is they're becoming data dumps. What I mean by data dumps is companies essentially put everything they can think of into those, into those disclosures, partly because they don't want to get sued. They don't want to be focused on later as not revealing enough information. And that's bad news for us because we have to separate the wheat from the chaff. We have to separate what's information from what's distraction. So one of the things I want to talk about today is how do you go through a 10K or, a 10, uh, or an annual report and figure out what's important and what's not. Because I think the key to doing valuation today is not that you don't have enough information, but separate out the information that matters from the information that doesn't. So let's get the process rolling. When you open up an annual report or 10K, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to read it for pleasure. There's nothing fun about reading a 10K or an annual report. And if you want to get the most out of this financial disclosure, you have to start off with a focus. In other words, you have to know what you're looking for before you start reading those statements. That sounds backwards. You're saying, I'll find it once I read it. That's not the way it works. You actually have to know what you're looking for if you plan to find it. Second, the whole point of looking up these numbers is they're feeding into your valuation of a company. In other words, when you read a story, when you read a section of the 10K, the question you've always got to be asking yourself is what number in my valuation is going to be changed by this particular information? So as much as I can, when I look at a 10K or an annual report, I'm looking to tie the information in those statements to numbers I use in my valuation, which is again a focus if you don't have, you're going to find this information very quickly slipping by you. So what I'd like to do today actually is take a company. The company I'm going to use is Procter & Gamble and use it to illustrate the process. But before I go through the process, let me lay, some, lay out the big picture of valuation. In a sense, lay the groundwork for what I'm looking for. When you look at the value of a company, any company, the value of a company rests on four pillars. These are the four groups of information or categories of information I'm looking for to value the company. The first thing I need to know is how much this company generates as cash flows from its existing investments, from its existing assets. I mean, a company, after all, has already made investments. It's got investments in the ground. I need to know what those investments are throwing off as earnings and cash flows. That, of course, is what you get by looking at the most re recent income statement, most recent balance sheet, as a sense of those existing cash flows. Second, I, as I'm reading that financial disclosure form, I'm also looking for clues, even though they, it might not be given directly, clues as to how quickly this company can grow in the future. Ultimately, growth can come from two places. It can come from running your assets more efficiently, or it can come from making new investments. So as I'm reading the disclosure form, I'm looking for clues on both dimensions. I'm looking to see whether the existing investments are efficiently run, and if they're not efficiently run, how much room for growth is there from, from, running those, from using those assets more efficiently. Second, I'm looking for the potential for new investments. How much is this company setting aside into new investments and how good are those new investments? What kind of returns are they generating? Now, I also have to think about how long a company can keep its growth pattern going. So if you're growing at 10, 12, 15%, one of the key questions I face in valuation is how long will it be before this company becomes a mature company? That again might not be given to you directly in a disclosure form, but you're looking for clues. Is my company a high growth company or is it a mature company or it's somewhere in the middle? The final dimension you're looking for is clues about risk. And ultimately, risk comes from two places. It comes from the operations of the company. What business is it, is, is it in? Because if you're in a risky business, I don't care how well run you are as a company, you are exposed to more risk. The second dimension I'm looking for on risk is financial risk. You can take a safe company and make it risky 
by creating contractual commitments, debt payments, lease payments. I'm looking for clues on both dimensions. So the end of my my search through a financial disclosure, I need to know what the existing cash flows are. What are the what are the cash flows of existing assets? What the potential for growth in this company? When this company will become a mature company, and how risky is it? So if you dis if you think in terms of inputs, these are the questions I would like to answer as I go through the disclosure form. On the existing investments, I'd like to know how much capital this company has invested in its existing investments. Now, those investments might have been made two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. So it's not clear how you get this number directly, but you're looking for clues again in the disclosure to answer that question. Second, you also want to know how good these investments are. That capital that's in invested in these existing assets, what kind of earnings are you making on that capital? So. The numbers I would need, I'd need to know what the current revenues are, current earnings are, and some measure of the invested capital in this company. And maybe the accounting book values will give me that, or maybe they'll allow me to at least get started on what that number is. The second dimension I'm looking on is future growth. And basically, again, as I mentioned in the previous page, that growth can come from either new investments or improved efficiency. And I'm looking at, again, numbers to help me make those judgments. So I'm looking at both revenue growth to see how, how quickly I can keep growing in the future and, and how much room there is to improve my operating margin. So I'm looking at the existing margin and saying, can I improve that number? Because if I can increase that number, I can get growth from efficiency. The third question I'm looking for is, how high quality is this growth? I mean, uh, stepping back, growth can be good, growth can be bad, growth can be neutral. Growth can create value, it can destroy value. To make a judgment on whether this company can create value from growth, I need to figure out how much new capital this company will have to invest to deliver whatever growth I've estimated for it. And here's a simple rule. The more capital I will have to invest to, get, to deliver a, a specific growth rate, the less, the less efficiently I'm delivering growth, the less valuable that growth becomes. So the numbers I'm looking for is how much is this company reinvesting? Reinvesting not just in long-term assets, but also in working capital and short-term assets. And what kind of return is it making on that invested capital? The higher that return on invested capital, the higher the quality of growth. Then I'm looking for clues on operating risk. And that's going to look, uh, no, I'm going to look in two places. One is I'm going to look at what businesses this company operates in. And it could be a company like GE in 26 different businesses, or it could be a company like Walmart in just one business. The second dimension on which I'm looking for risk is I'm looking for the countries in which my company operates. The reason that matters is if you're a retailer invested just in the U.S., you might be less risky to me than if you're a retailer with 70% of your revenues in the U.S. and the 30% from Mexico. So I need to know what countries your company gets its revenues from. On financial risk, I'm, I'm looking to see how much debt you owe, short term as well as long term. And I'm also checking to see whether you have any other contractual commitments. So on the risk measures, uh, since I, I, I missed the measures that I would, I would look for, when I look at a financial disclosure form, I'm looking for some measure of relative risk. I mean, you can call it beta, you can call it something else. I'm looking for what kind of equity risk premium should I be attaching to this company given the different countries it operates in. And I'm looking for some measure of the cost of capital. On the debt issue, I'm looking to see how much this company has as traditional debt. I'm also looking at lease commitments and converting those into a debt ratio, a ratio of the overall capital that comes from debt and a cost for that debt. Then there's final mopping up to do. What am I talking about? I mean, companies often have holdings in other companies. These could be minority holdings or majority holdings. I've got to bring them into the process. It might own assets that have, haven't been counted yet. There might be you know, vacant real estate that you haven't used. You have to value that and bring it in. And you also have to see whether there are any other claims that others might have on the equity of your firm. I mean, specifically, I'm talking about employee options, but it could be conversion convertibles, it could be warrants, it could be other claims and equity. Because if I'm a stockholder in this company, I've got to factor those claims in. So broadly speaking, those are the questions that I need the answers for. And I actually have those questions before I even open the 10K. So here's the template that I use for reading any financial disclosure, no, annual report or 10K. First, I check for timing. What period does this financial disclosure form cover? It could be a calendar year. It could be June to June. It could be March to March. Don't assume. You never know what that period is until you've checked it. Second, check what currency all the numbers are going to be reported. In. Again, it's easy to make an assumption. You're saying it's a U.S. company. It must be in dollars. You're probably right, but check anyway. I mean, and I'll tell you why it's important that you check. Let's say you're looking at uh, Gazprom. 
It's a Russian company, right? But because it's an oil company, it tends to report everything in U.S. dollars. A lot, a lot of commodity companies report everything in dollars, no matter where they're located. So check the currency. Make sure you, you know what you're looking at before you start looking at the numbers. Second, look for clues in business mix. Most annual reports, most 10Ks, will, will give you a breakdown by segment. Now, you might agree with the segments that your company breaks itself down into, or you could override that breakdown and come up with your own breakdown, but you got to start with what the company tells you. What are the businesses it's in? How much revenues does it get from each business? Some companies even report how much operating income. You can look at it. You know, you know, I don't know how much weight you want to put into it because there are all kinds of allocation judgments that might, that might affect it. But you want to see what the segment breakdown is. What are the businesses your company is in? While you're there, check to see if there's any geographic breakdown on revenues. Some companies break down revenues by country. So if you're in three or four or five countries, they'll break down revenues by country. Big multinationals like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble often break down revenues by region. Northern, North America, Western Europe, Asia. Look for clues on the breakdown and see if you can use those clues to come up with a measure of the, the risk premium you'd be attaching to the company. Read through that risk section. I've generally found it not particularly useful, but most 10Ks or annual reports are four or five pages where the company generically lists out all the risks they're exposed to. Look for specifics. Look for something you can use rather than the generic or things could go wrong. Then you're going to go to what I call the meat and potatoes part of valuation. You're looking for numbers. And those numbers, for the most part, are going to come from the financial statements in the financial disclosure form, the annual report of the 10K. Start with the income statement, you know? and here are the key numbers you want to start with, but you might have, you know, there might be other numbers you need to come back to, but these are the numbers at the minimum that I need. I need the revenues, I need the earnings, operating earnings, net income, I need interest expenses, and while I'm in the income statement, I'm trying to get a sense of what the tax rate this company is paying on its overall income is. Now, usually in most companies' annual reports at 10Ks, they will give you this information for maybe two years, maybe even three. Take into account all of those. There is value in knowing the history of a company. Next step in the process, go to the balance sheet. Start with that shareholder's equity line item that's usually in the balance sheet that incorporates retained earnings, paid in capital, all the stuff that's supposed to go into, it, into equity. While you're there, also check out the long-term debt outstanding as well as a short-term debt, which is usually under current, uh, current liabilities. Check for how much this company has in cash and, and marketable securities. And sometimes they're broken into two items, sometimes a one item. And also check to see how much your company has in working capital, current assets, current liabilities, making sure that you strip out the cash from the current assets and the debt from the current liabilities because you've viewed them separately. Also check to see while you're in the balance sheet whether there are any clues as to the cross holdings this company might have in other companies. If it owns 10, 15, 20% of a company, you will usually find the item on the asset side as a holding in another company. It might have other names, but that's what you're looking for. If it owns 55, 60, 65% of another company, that's a majority holding. And in most countries, companies are required to consolidate. They have to count 100% of the subsidiary as if it belongs to them which leaves them with a problem because they then have a 35, 40, 45 percent of the subsidiary that doesn't belong to them. That usually will show up on the liability side of the balance sheet as a minority interest. So check to see if that minority interest is listed. Then move to the last financial statement, which is usually the statement of cash flows. Look for changes. The usefulness of the statement of cash flows first is that everything is stated in cash flow terms and second it looks at changes in assets and working capital. So look for the change in working capital. Look for what the company made in capital expenditures. If it had made acquisitions and it stated there cash acquisitions, look for that. Look for depreciation and, and amortization, usually the bunch together. And look to see how much debt was issued and repaid during the course of the year. Then follow through. Start looking at the footnotes. And there are usually dozens of footnotes, but here's what you're looking for. First, you're looking for contractual commitments, whether they're leases, rental, or other commitments. See if you can find information. Most U.S. companies are required in a table to reveal their commitments for the next five years and beyond. See if you can find that table. Look at, While you're in the footnotes, look to see what, they, what information they give you on employee compensation. If they've granted options in the past, they have to tell you how many options are still outstanding, when they come due, what the average exercise price is, so collect the information on that. Most companies in the footnotes also tell you when their debt comes due, how much debt is coming due in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and beyond. Keep track of that. 
And finally, if you have pension and healthcare obligations, and this is especially true if you have older companies, increasingly they require to report how underfunded these obligations might be. Look for that number and also look to see how they computed the value of those assets because they have to use some kind of, you know, the, or the value of their liabilities because they have to make some assumptions to make those judgments, take, take account of those assumptions. Finally, look for, for clues on how many units are outstanding, how many shares are outstanding. You say, what do you mean clues? That should be right there. Well, you'd be surprised at how many different mentions you'd see of the number of shares and how they might not all agree. So start with the primary number of shares outstanding. They, you know, keep track of the diluted. You might not use it, but keep track of it. If your employees were granted restricted stock units, which are basically shares which you cannot trade for a certain period, see, see whether there are, how many there are, and whether they're included in the number of shares outstanding. And key, if, you're, if, you're, if you did acquisitions and you did not pay for it with cash, you won't find it in your statement of cash flows, see how many shares were used to pay for that, the, the, those, those acquisitions. Because that information is necessary in your valuation. Finally, look for general clues on corporate governance, which is how much power do you think you as a stockholder in this company you will have in this company? So look to see whether all the shares have the same voting rights or if there are differences, what the differences are, and whether insiders get any, get any special rights or privileges that you might not have. So by the time you finish reading the financial disclosure, you should have all of this information ready to go. So you ready? Let's try this. The company, as I said, I'm going to do this honest Procter & Gamble large you know large US company lots of disclosures and basically I'm going to try to value Procter & Gamble in September 2012 so the first thing I did was I visited the SEC web website and I looked for the most recent disclosure now a couple of things to note when you do evaluation every input in your in your in your valuation should reflect the most updated numbers you can find for that company right now which creates a little bit of an inconsistency on timing because market-based numbers like interest rates and risk premiums you can update every minute of every day but accounting information you're stuck with whenever the last accounting statements came up now when I look for the financial disclosure forms for Procter & Gamble I got lucky and here's why I got lucky their most recent 10k came out in June of 2012 that was in fact the most recent filing why is that no why, why is that lucky because if their most recent 10k had had a December 31st end then I'd have to pull up a 10Q and create a trailing 12 months to get more updated numbers. I'll do, on a, on a separate webcast, I'll focus on how to create those trailing 12 month numbers. For, but for Procter & Gamble, I was home free. I had the most recent 12 months in that 10K. The year end was, you know, June, 30, June 30th of 2012. And in fact, if you look at page three of the 10K, you know, and I'll pull up the 10K, page three. It says as of June 30th, 2012. So there it is. So basically, you're confirming for yourself that in fact it is the most recent financial. I also checked to make sure the numbers were in US dollars. You know, you never know. So it, I'm, I'm all set. I have the most recent 10K for Procter and Gamble, and it also is the most recent 12 months. I also made made sure the numbers are in dollars. So let me go through the process of what I did. The 10K was actually 239 pages long. So on my way in to work one morning, or it's a 40-minute commute, I browsed through the 10K. Notice I didn't read the 10K. I don't, don't have to. Basically, what I'm looking for is information and where it is in the 10K. And this is actually an example of what I do when I go through a 10K. As I go through, I keep a little notepad, an electronic notepad, and on pages where I find interesting things that I might use in the valuation. And, I, and, you know, and, and as I said earlier, I already have a sense of what I'm looking for, I, I make a note to myself that that's where I found the information. So this, for example, was my list at the end of the Procter & Gamble 10K. Notice it ends on page 107, and I told you the 10K was 239 pages. The last 132 pages included nothing of importance or value to me. And even in the first 107 pages, only about a third of the pages had useful information. It tells you how much of a conventional financial disclosure you never use in valuation. So here's what I'd like to do. I would like to you take it to, to, to show you my Excel spreadsheet for Procter & Gamble. And as I said, everything I do, everything I look for goes in, into evaluation. And this is my standard spreadsheet to value almost any company. So I will take you item by item through the spreadsheet and talk a little bit about where I found the information 
to finish the spreadsheet and then I'll actually open up the Excel spreadsheet to kind of complete the story. So let's start at the top. What industry is Procter & Gamble in? I, uh, on page 3 they actually give you a breakdown of the 10k. They actually give you a breakdown of their businesses and then they extend it out on other pages. You get more information later. In page. So if you go back to the previous page you'll see that on pages 30, 30 the, you know, the, when you get, get up to later in the process, you'll see more information on the breakdown by businesses, 36 through 43. So I'll come back and talk about how I use that, but for the moment, you know, I, I just want one grouping, and the grouping I pick for Procter & Gamble is household products. Now, you're saying, how did I decide on household products? There's actually a pull-up menu on this Excel spreadsheet, and I'll show it to you when I open the spreadsheet where I have 101 businesses that I've classified U.S. companies into and I'm looking for the business that's closest, the one that I'm most likely to put Procter & Gamble in. And to me, household products made sense. Now let's talk about the numbers. The first set of numbers I need are revenue numbers. I need it for both this year and last year. And if you go to page 66 of your 10K, so let me go to page 66 here. You see the revenues last year, revenues this year, 2011, 2012. Those are the numbers that I actually pulled up you know, and entered as revenues last year and this year. In fact, if you stay on that page, page 66, and look a little further down, there's operating income. That's the next set of numbers on the spreadsheet is the operating income, the operating income last year and this year. Then I ask you for book value of equity and book value of debt, and that's in the balance sheet. So if you go to page... 67 you have the balance sheet and if you scroll down on the balance sheet you see shareholders equity last year this year that is the that is the total number it includes everything those numbers the two numbers are the shareholders equity and in fact while I'm there I'm also going to look up the total long-term debt and the short-term debt the sum of the long-term and the short-term debt is the total debt that's the next set of numbers that you see on the spreadsheet is the total is the total debt in the company so book value of debt then I ask you do you have operating lease commitments now you're saying how do you know well when I was reviewing the 10k I did notice that they had lease commitments so I entered yes but if you enter yes there is another worksheet in this Excel spreadsheet and so this is when I'm going to pull up the spreadsheet so you can see what I'm talking about there's another worksheet in the spreadsheet so this is the basic spreadsheet and there's another worksheet called Operating Lease Commitments where I ask you what those commitments will be in the future. Right? So the, to get those lease commitments, let me take, go back to the, the presentation. To get those lease commitments, the Operating Lease Commitments, I have to go to page 103. And on page 103 of my 10K, you'll see my lease commitments for the next five years and beyond. Those are the numbers that you see in the Excel spreadsheet as my numbers for the next five years and beyond. There was one miss piece of missing information and I'll come, and come back and talk about it. Usually when companies reveal their commitments for the future, they also tell you what your lease expense was in the most recent year. I could not find it. Maybe I completely missed it. I could not find it for, um, for Procter & Gamble. But essentially, here's what I assumed. I assumed that it would be pretty close to what it was in year one, which is it is for most firms and enter that number as my current year's lease payment. So let's go back to the spreadsheet because I mean I, I want to keep to complete this process. Then I ask you for cash and cross holdings and that's again on the balance sheet. So if you go back to the balance sheet and look at page 67, on page 67 of the 10K, see cash and equivalents right there on top. Procter & Gamble happens to consolidate its cash and cash equivalents to one line item, which is nice because I don't have to add up two numbers. But that's the cash that you see on the, as my cash and cross holdings. Then I ask you for non-operating assets. And if you go back and look at the balance sheet, there was nothing there that suggested they had any non-operating assets. Then I look for minority interest. And that's what it's called in most financials. But when I looked in Procter & Gamble's 10K, I could not find minority interest, but if you keep looking under shareholders equity, it says non-controlling interest. That's actually just another name for minority interest. And that's actually one of the things that companies do that throws people off is they don't always use the same terms in balance sheets. 
but that's my minority interest and that's basically what I entered in as my minority interest in my so I'm gonna to go to my spreadsheet because basically that has all the numbers anyway and so the minority interest is is the number right off the balance sheet that I've entered in okay then as number of shares outstanding the number of shares outstanding is actually in a couple of different places it's on page 3 on page 68 and then again on page 113 the page 3 and page 68 numbers don't match up and here's why the page 3 number actually gives you the July 31st estimate of the number of shares so if you go back to page 3 you'll see an estimate and let me go back to page 3 okay. so you'll see the number of shares outstanding as of okay. so you'll see a number of shares outstanding in on, no, early in the process okay. but on page 68 the number so the number of shares outstanding right there July 31st but on page 68, you get number of shares outstanding as of June 30th, which is one reason why the shares don't match up. I want the most updated information I can, so I stuck with the July 31st number. So if you have multiple, num if you find these number of shares in multiple places, go with the most recent estimate. In fact, I also checked Yahoo Finance, which is a September 1st, which was actually you know much closer to when I was doing the valuation. And they, they actually had the same number. as, But if that number had been different from the July 31st, I'd have gone with that number because I need the most recent estimate for the number of shares. And as for the current stock price, and this actually I did look up on Yahoo Finance on the day that I did this valuation. Or, you know, and you can use whatever source you use for prices. And as for an effective tax rate. Now, if you look at page 32 of the 10K, you actually see an effective tax rate reported, right? That 27.1%. I'm a little wary about using numbers that companies report for me, so maybe I'm just you know, naturally suspicious. But if you go to page 66, you can actually compute the effective tax rate yourself from the income statement. Sorry, let me try that again. Page 66. And the way you can compute your tax, tax rate is to take the taxes paid. See 3,468? And divide by the twelve thousand seven eighty five, which is the earnings before in before taxes. That's and if you do that, you get twenty seven point one percent. So in this case, it turns out that they reported the right number. And as for a marginal tax rate, and the marginal tax rate usually is not in your ten k. It's from the tax code, so you can always use the tax rate, the marginal tax rate of the country in which the company operates. But in the case of Procter and Gamble, they did help me out because on page one hundred of the 10k again I'm sorry let me try that again 100 of the 10k you actually see them report the US federal tax rate 35 percent so that's the tax rate you see as my marginal tax rate now let's talk about the forward-looking numbers okay? the forward-looking numbers you can look for clues in the 10k but these are your estimates but it's good to start with what you know in this case if you look back at page 57 of the uh, of the uh, of the 10k You'll actually see Procter & Gamble has broken down how quickly each business has grown over the last couple of years. And also, and this is useful, not all companies do this, how much of that growth was organic growth from internal investments and how much is acquired growth. What are you looking for here? You're looking for, for several things. One is you're looking to see whether some businesses are growing faster than other businesses. You're also looking to see if a big chunk of the growth is acquired. Okay. The, the reason the first matters is if one business is growing faster, it's going to get bigger. So over time, it's going to become a larger chunk of the company, and that might affect your, your risk measures and your cost, you know, whatever you use as a discount rate. And if a lot of your growth is acquired growth, you have to make sure you're paying for those acquisitions somewhere in your valuation. In the case of Procter & Gamble, what you get is a, is a whole lot of blahs. The revenues haven't grown much. No, very very low growth. The businesses are all pretty seem all, all, seem like they're all mature businesses. So basically, in my forecast, I stuck with a fairly low growth rate, three percent. Now, if you go back to page thirty of your of the ten k, you actually see the margins that Procter and Gamble had in two thousand and twelve versus two thousand and eleven and two thousand and ten. The margin I'm interested in is the operating margin. A couple of things. One is I can see the margin right now is 15.9%. 
But it's also useful to see that the margin started at 20.3% in 2010 and has slid. So there's some kind of external factor or an internal factor that's putting pressure on margins. So at least for my initial analysis, I'm going to leave the margin at at close to where it is right now, 16%. Okay. We'll come back and talk about what if I think it's going to bounce back to 2010 levels, but for my base case, I've left it at 16%. Now, the next number says sales to capital ratio. That's actually a number you can compute. It's the total revenues that you see up there divided by the total invested capital, which is book value of equity plus debt minus cash. And if you look to the right of the Excel spreadsheet, I compute those numbers based on the inputs I've already entered. So I've left it at existing levels because... Procter & Gamble is a pretty mature company. I don't expect this number to kind of jump in the near future. I'll tell you when you might want to make it different from the existing number. If you have a company in transition that's shifting, that's uh, trying to become more efficient, then that sales to capital ratio might go up going forward. You get more revenues per dollar of capital. If it's getting less efficient, it might come down. So that's basically what drove that particular input. For the risk-free rate, obviously, I'm not going to go look in the 10K. That's external. I looked up the 10-year the US T bond rate at that time that I did this valuation was at 1.6 percent. And for the cost of capital, initially, here's what I did: I computed the cost of capital by by filling out the numbers in the spreadsheet. And and some of these numbers came from this 10K. Some came from outside. Now, notice that the, some of the numbers on this worksheet are green and some are yellow. The green numbers are the numbers I've already entered, that I'm just copying from the original page. The number of shares and market price I entered earlier, so I use that. The unlevered beta is, is, reflects the businesses you're in. So this is where knowing what businesses you're in helps. So let me go back to the 10K because I was looking to see what businesses I should put Procter & Gamble in. And actually, they do a very good job of breaking their businesses down. So if you go to page 36, you see them break their businesses down. And if you keep going, they take, in the, in the following pages, they take each business and tell you how much that business made in revenues, what it earned. So basically, they give you a breakdown of the businesses. They break themselves down into six businesses, but it was too detailed. So what I did was I actually broke their business. I, I, I did my own categorization of these six businesses into three. Household products, toiletries and cosmetics, and medical supplies, which are mostly non-invasive. I took the revenues from the 36 through 43, used those revenues to come up with weights. Okay. Uh, the, the green for the EV to sales and unlevered beta are numbers I compute for industry averages. So if you look in the worksheet, there's actually a, 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 a later in the, in, the, in the same spreadsheet, there's a worksheet where these industry averages are. And if you're not using this particular spreadsheet, those numbers are on my website. They're in other places as well. So what I do is I take the revenues I have for the company, take the unlevered betas, weight them by the estimated value that I get for each business. The 1.06 is my weighted average of the three businesses that Procter & Gamble is in, but the information came from the financial disclosure. Okay. The risk-free rate is in U.S. dollars, so that's already input as 1.6%. For the equity risk premium, I look to see where... Procter & Gamble got its revenues. And if you look at page 6 of the 10K, okay, they actually start, and actually I have to start a little earlier, they start breaking down how, what percentage of their revenues come from different parts of the world. In North America, Western Europe, Asia, and they do kind of create these, these mixes. So the last CMEA includes Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa. But I, I have to work with what I have and that's all they give me. So I break down their revenues based on their in, into, the, into the different regions of the world. I have again on my website equity risk premiums for these regions that I've computed. I enter those numbers and I take a weighted average. That's basically what you see as a 7.8%. To provide a con contrast, if Procter & Gamble had had all of its revenues in the U.S., that equity risk premium would have been only 6%. So the extra 1.8% reflects Procter & Gamble's exposure in emerging markets. Now, it's true that the breakdowns don't quite match up, that they're mixing together Africa, Middle East, and Eastern Europe. I'd wish they'd broken it down into its individual regions and had to make some judgment calls. But as I said, that's not going to make a huge difference to my equity risk premium. The book value of debt I've already computed. To try to convert book value to debt, I use a very simple approach. I try to treat it like a, like a bond, and I try to price it. To do this, I need the book value of debt, which I already have. 
I need the interest expense on the debt, which is right there in page 66 of your income statement. So if you go back and look at page 66, you'll find the, you know, the interest expense right there, 769 million. So I enter that. Um, I need an average maturity for the debt. And this actually is where the footnotes help me. If you go to page 82 of the footnotes, you'll start to see a breakdown of when the debt comes due. The, the table I actually use is towards the bottom where it tells me how much debt is coming due in each of the next five years. And if you go to the previous page, it tells me how much debt is due within one year. So that's what I use for creating the table at the bottom of this cost of capital page. There's the debt due in less than a year. There's the debt due in the next five years. Then I took whatever debt was not in the table, what, what wasn't in, in one of those two tables, and I made a debt due beyond year five and gave it an arbitrary maturity of 10 years. If you want to give it eight, 15, whatever you decide to do, it's not again we're going to make a huge difference. I took the weights, took a weighted average. The weighted average maturity of the debt is about 3.41 years. That's what you see as the maturity of the debt. And then as for a pre-tax cost of debt. Now there are a couple of ways you can compute a pre-tax cost of debt. One is you can try to you know, find a bond that's traded and look up the yield to mature in the bond. But I actually prefer to take the rating either an actual rating or a synthetic bond rating for the company and try to come up with a pre-tax cost of debt. And in this particular case, Procter & Gamble actually helped me out because on page 48 of the 10K, they told me what their ratings were. If they hadn't told me, it wasn't a big deal. I could have gone and looked it up, but this did save me that trip. So that's the rating for the, and the rating for based on for S&P that they got was AA. And the default spread for a AA rated bond that I was using at the time of this valuation was 1.25%. You add the 1.25% to the 1.6%, there's my cost of debt. That's pretty much it. They do have a minuscule amount of preferred stock, but it's convertible preferred stock, and I've chosen not to even include it in my analysis. And here's my rule of thumb. Preferred stock is a pain in the neck. It's neither debt nor equity. It's difficult to categorize. So if this had been a big number, I'd have thrown it in there, but I'd have had to then look up a preferred dividend. In the case of Procter & Gamble, there was very little information on the preferred stock, and it was less than 2% of the overall capital. So I've chosen to ignore it, which basically means when you look at the cost of capital calculation, based on my estimates, the market value of equity and the market value of debt, they're about 86% equity, 14% debt. The cost of equity based on my estimate of the equity risk premium and the beta and the beta I do lever back up using your debt to equity ratio. Overall that gives me a cost of capital of 9.47% which is what you see as my cost of capital for Procter & Gamble in my valuation. Last loose cent to tie up. Do you have employee options outstanding? Well I looked and page 91 of the 10k. Oops sorry. 91 of the 10k you see the information on employee options and they tell me what the weighted mature I mean they basically give me all the information I need so if you look at the bottom of the page they tell me how many options are outstanding 353.09 million the fact that only some are exercisable I just over you know, just overlook I look at the exercisable options I look at the maturity I look at when the you no know, when it comes due and I in incorporate all of that information in there in fact Procter & Gamble did give me a standard deviation for the stock price of 20%. I've left it at that number. Now it's really 12 to 18, but I've, I've actually kind of you know, left it at about 20% because, and if I couldn't find it in the, in, in the, in the disclosure, disclosure form, this is, I, can, I can find this in a number of other places. So it's not a big deal. So I got the standard deviation entered. That's pretty much it. There are a bunch of default assumptions were asked you to change those defaults if you don't like them you for those you probably have to make judgment calls you're not likely to find the answers in the 10k but I have all the numbers I need let's see what the valuation looks like with my numbers now I, a couple of things one is when I do a valuation of a company I try the best I can not to think about the market price while I'm doing the valuation. I just want to do the valuation first and then ask all the questions I want to ask. And based on the numbers I've entered, the value I get for Procter & Gamble is $41. Stock's at 69 Your first inclination, and it's human nature, when you get a number that different is you say, what could I have done wrong? And that's a good place to start. So you can go back and change the inputs if you want using whatever and, and at this stage you might revisit the disclosure saying is there something else I missed is there a business I mixed that's a good way to approach 
that follow-up process. But get your base case done first before you decide to embark on that trip. So let me go back to the presentation because now that I've talked about the inputs, I want to kind of wrap up with a few pieces of parting suggestions more than advice. First suggestion, as you read 10Ks annual reports, skip the pablum. There's a whole lot of boilerplate that seems to have found its way into financial disclosure forms. And I think it's written by the lawyers, for the lawyers, of the lawyers. So it really is of very little use for, for most investors. So if you look at the risk discussion for Procter & Gamble, which is in pages 6 to 13, much of it is completely useless. It either states the obvious, change in consumer demand could affect Procter & Gamble, of course, or it says nothing of value if we successfully man manage organizational change. I'm not even sure what that means. We could become a more valuable company. So as you read through, kind of ignore that part because it really doesn't help you in the valuation. Second, don't sweat the small stuff. As you read through the disclosure form, you'll see two, three, five, eight pages often spent on things that really don't matter. As an example, if you look at Procter & Gamble, page, the 10K in pages 34 and 35, they spend a couple of pages talking about all the risks they're exposed to in Venezuela. Now, if Procter & Gamble got 30% of its revenues in Venezuela, I would care. But they get so little revenues in Venezuela that I looked at that section and said, why would I care? What difference is it going to make in my overall valuation? Third, Cross-check across financial statements. What I mean by that is when you look at the statement of cash flows, for instance, you get a number for capital expenditure, which is what you're investing in long-term assets. But remember, what you invest in long-term assets should also increase the number on your balance sheet. The fixed assets on your balance sheet should increase by roughly that amount. So what I often do when I look at a company is I look at the numbers in the ten, in, in, in my statement of cash flows and check to see whether I'm coming up with, you'll never get exactly the same number, whether I'm coming up with similar numbers. So if, you're, if they're reporting a change in working capital of $800 million in the statement of cash flows, I look to see, the, the, if I look at two years of balance sheets, whether if I computed the change, I come up with a similar number, and if I don't, what am I missing? Because usually you will get clues to missing items when you start doing it, whether they've been acquisitions that weren't paid for with cash or something else. Okay. So try to cross-check across financial statements. Numbers should match up for the most part. And fill in the gaps. Fill in the gaps in what sense? Sometimes as you go through a financial disclosure form, there will be information you wish you had that will not be there, or you can't find it. Now, I know a lot of people, when they cannot find information, say, I cannot find the information, so I'm going to ignore it. That's the equivalent of assuming zero. I'll give you an example. I told you that when I was looking through the lease commitments, they did not, a Procter & Gamble didn't tell me how much lease payment they had in the most recent year. The number I need. Now, I could beat myself up, or I could put zero, but I think that's an extreme assumption. Looking across companies, the lease payment in the most recent year is very close to the lease commitment in year one. I chose to make an assumption when I did not have the information, and I would suggest the same. You can either use the company's own history, or you can look at industry norms. So if, not, if something is missing, and in, in emerging markets, big pieces might be missing, make your best estimate or ba best assumption given what you know about the company, about the market, about the rest of the sector. That's pretty much it. I hope you found this 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 webcast useful. But the best way for you to kind of master this is pick up a 10K on your own. Pick up an annual report on your own. Try to do a valuation with it going through this process. Thank you and have a good day.